Joshua chapter 2. I don't know, I don't know if I said that. All right. I can't get out of Joshua no matter how hard I, I mean, not that I try, but God always leaves me here in Joshua. All right, so let's pray. So, Lord, we come before you now. We thank you so much for the opportunity to pray, an opportunity to just talk about your word, Lord, as brothers and sisters, Lord. We pray that you'd uh, bless this time, set this time apart just for us to be able to receive what it is we need to receive. Each one of us individually is seeking something. So I pray that each one of us would receive something that will help us out in what we're dealing with right now in our lives. Each one of us are dealing with something different. Maybe it's health issues, financial issues, um, just direction as well. So I pray for traveling mercies for Pastor George and his family, Lord. I pray for my daughters coming back with some friends from Vegas. I pray that you give her traveling mercies as well. I pray for my wife. She's flying in from Oklahoma today. Um, one of my students at Calvary passed away this few weeks ago. So I pray that you bless the family. I know the memorial service is this afternoon. I pray that you give peace where needed in the hearts of uh, this family, bless them, Lord, and I don't know, I mean, uh, this girl was am was amazing, I mean, she loved you a lot, so I don't doubt where she is, I just, obviously, it, it's heartbreaking uh, that a 22-year-old would pass away from a brain tumor, so um, give that mom and dad peace, and her brothers and sisters as well, I pray uh, for Joshua and this word that you bless it now, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, Joshua chapter 2. So, I love the book of Joshua. It took some time. Um, and, and really studying Joshua, I've come to understand that this book is more than just, it's more than just a story of war. It's really a story of, of the Spirit. And that's what this book really is about, how there's a transition between the time of Moses and a time of Joshua. Moses fought some great battles. Moses was considered one of the greatest prophets in the Bible, right? In the Old Testament um, books of the Bible. He wrote the first five books of the Bible, the belief is. He fought fantastic wars. God spoke to him in such an amazing way compared to the way that he spoke to everyone else. And it says that. It also says that Moses was the humblest man in the, on the earth at that time. How amazing out of millions of people on the earth at that time to be considered the humblest man on the earth. And I, always, I compare that so much to people today, and I think to myself, who can fill those shoes to be considered the humblest man on the earth today? I mean, there's some people that run through my mind I think about, but Moses did amazing things through God. God spoke to him in a way that when you read the scriptures later on, there's not too many people in the Bible that he spoke to that way. And so it, it just it blows my mind, you know, and it, it's sad in a sense, too, that Moses wasn't able to go into the promised land. Right. They, we talk about that because he misrepresented God. But there's also a belief as well that he couldn't go into the into the new um, into the promised land because there was a transition again from. To, to the spirit in a sense, right? Because Joshua is a type of Christ. And so in, at the end of, I'm just going to briefly touch on chapter one because, you know, I think it'll help us in chapter two. So in, in, a, in Deuteronomy in the last chapter, I'll just read some of the verses. It says, And Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo to the top of Pesha, which is across from Jericho, and the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead as far as Dan and Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city palm trees, and as far as Zor, the Lord said to him, This is a land which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to your descendants. I have caused you to see it with your eyes, but you shall not cross over there. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, 
opposite Beth Peor, but no one knows where his grave is to this day. And like I talked about last time, I think the reason why God buried him himself, which is awesome, is because they didn't, he didn't want people worshiping Moses, right? And, and think about it. If you really think about it, even today, there would be shrines of everywhere, people with statues of people worshiping Moses, right? Wouldn't it? I think it would be. I mean, look at the Virgin Mary. You know, everywhere there's people, these sightings of, you know, I was watching something on Facebook, and they had this wall, and they, they said that they, all these people were, were around this wall, supposedly this image of Mary appeared crying and all that. And I think he, it would have probably even been worse with Moses, right? All these people would have been absolutely bananas for this man. But, I, but how amazing that God took his, his spirit and he poured it on this man, and this man was able to do those miracles that he did, parting the Red Sea and, 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 and just all these miracles that God did through him. And, and even today, you see people that, that are anointed to, to speak God's word in a way that, you know, I hear, like, I remember sitting under Pastor Chuck when I was a kid. I mean, not a kid, but when I was younger, when I worked at Calvary. Um, I used to drive out to Costa Mesa because I wanted to hear the father of, of Calvary Chapel speak. You know, so I would go and I would sit in the front row. And I'd be looking right up at Pastor Chuck like, Maybe in, in a sense I was worshiping him because, you know, I was a brand new believer and I wanted to hear the teachings of, of the, the Calvary Chapel, the one who started the whole thing, who God used in an amazing way. And so I did that. I used to do that all the time. But I, I he was so anointed, you know, he, he sat there so simply, just sat in his, in his seat and just spoke the word and it just poured out of him. You know, I don't know if you ever if you've ever sat and listened to Pastor Chuck, but he was just amazing. You know, and I, I was so bummed when he died. And I think about another example of Moses to me was Martin Luther King. You know, he wasn't a perfect man by no means. You know, you read his history and all the things that he did a lot of things, but this man led thousands of people in marches and did amazing things. And he always put God first to say that. It was God. You know, I read this story how he was, and he loved, right? Was the greatest gift. Jesus says to, to love our neighbors ourselves and love him with all our heart, mind, and soul. Those are the two things that, that will, will, will last after everything else is gone, right? That we love God and that we love our neighbor. And one of the speeches that Martin Luther King was giving, there was thousands of people there. And there was this Caucasian man that was in the crowd yelling at Martin Luther King, rushed on the stage hit him and knocked him down and there was all these guards that were charging this man to they were going to tear him up they, they rushed on the stage Martin Luther King jumped on this guy and covered him and would not let them beat beat this man up and he picked this man up dusted him off and loved him after he hit him right and this man started bawling because of what he had done because Martin Luther King didn't return the hatred that this man had for him. He loved him, right? I think about Moses, right? Out of all these, when he walked through the wilderness, right? He didn't have to do this, right? He didn't, want, he didn't even want to do it. He said, Lord, get somebody else. I don't want to do it, right? And, Lord, and God raised up his brother to help him out. And then he, he spent 40 years in the wilderness leading these ungrateful people through the wilderness, right? That complained at every, every turn, you know, I'm tired of eating manna. When are we going to eat something else? And all these other things. And yet, Moses still stuck in there. And he said, Lord, if you're going to blot them out, then take me out of your book of life as well. I don't want to be a part of it. Moses loved those people. Right? And that's the heart of a shepherd. That's the true heart of a shepherd. You know, I, I think about, you know, some of these pastors are so into, you know, I go to different churches and I've, I've listened to pastors speak. And you can always tell who has a real heart for the people, you know? And, and it just got such a humility. These, some of these pastors, man, I'm, I just think, what has God done in their lives to prepare them for where they are, you know? It's such a humility, man, and, and such a love for the flock. And I, and I always think, you know, as a, as a man who speaks God's word, do I love people that much? I don't, I don't know. I do. My heart breaks when I hear things that happen to people. And I want everybody to be okay. But do I really have a heart to be a shepherd of God? I don't know. 
I mean, obviously, God put, keeps putting me in front. <laughs> I'm like, I'm Moses, man. I'm like, I don't want any, Lord. Get somebody else, man. But I know I love people, and I hate it sometimes because I feel like I get ran over sometimes. And my brothers are like, man, you're too nice, man. It's like, yeah, but I can't help it, man. I just don't hate. I hate to see people hurt or, or, or don't have what they need. So anyway, Moses was amazing. So in the book of Joshua, chapter 1, I'll breeze through it really fast. Chapter 1 is after Moses died. Moses, my servant, is dead. This is God speaking to Joshua. My servant is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people to the land which I am giving to them, to the children of Israel. So God commissioned Joshua right there based on Joshua being raised up, right? All in the, in the, in the books before that, previous books, Moses was putting Joshua in front so that he would start to, so people would start to respect him, start to know of his, his courage and his ability to lead and all those other things. God saw leadership qualities in Joshua. He saw a love for the people in Joshua. He saw that Joshua was teachable. All those things that are, I think, that are needed to be a great leader. Because it's not, it, it, great leaders aren't just somebody who, who dictates what to do. A great leader is someone who knows how to take orders as well. A great leader is also someone that's trainable, I think. Someone that has a heart for the people, you know. Um, I, I, I've been re I read this other story about um, this man who was a CEO of a huge company, and he was so evil to his employees, very evil to the way he treated his employees. It was all about him. You know, every time the, the employees accomplished or they accomplished something great, this leader would stand up and take credit for it, never gave, never gave um, credit to his staff. And that's the, the one thing I remember when I, when I ran my store as a manager, that I would never say, well, look what I've done. I'd always say, well, look, it was a team effort. When I was a, I was a human resource manager for Target, I remember, and I used to, um, it was 500 people in the store. And every time we got on stage, because once a month, this was one of the largest Target, I mean, uh, Home, Dep Home Depot. It was a lot, one of the largest Home Depot. I worked for Home Depot and Target as well, both human resources. So, But the 500 employees was the one I worked at for Home Depot in Marina del Rey. And every month, we used to close the store. We had 500 employees that would scan in and get paid for three hours. And we would have gatherings, pizza. We'd have music. We'd have all those things. And we'd build these stages. And I remember I would get on this stage and, and talk to all these people, 500 people. And I just remember never wanting to give credit to myself for victories that we had, for payroll, for for training percentages or any of those things. I wanted to bring glory to the people. So I would embarrass people, right? We give out TVs, we give out stereos at that time. So I would say, hey, look at, Jan did this. Look at her numbers. And I would always bring glory to the people that were in the stage because without your staff, you're nothing, you know? And it's just like these, these great people, when Moses anointed these men, when, when he put his spirit on, all, on these other men, all these people took different areas of ministry, right? A senior pastor is supposed to pray for his staff, his, his leadership, and say, you're over this place, you're over this place. And, and those people are an extension of that leader. So if that leader's great, then those followers are supposed to be great as well, right? Because the leader, they're supposed to be a reflection of, of that leader. And you see that in even Brian Brodison. When Pastor Chuck passed away, and Brian Brodison took the reign. He's a mini me of Pastor Chuck, I think. You know, he loves the sheep. He 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 preaches um, love and and all those other things. I don't even know how I went there. This was not in my notes, guys. Okay. So anyway, only be strong and very courageous. He told him uh, Joshua to be strong and courageous. So in Joshua chapter two, it says. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Shittim. It says Shittim in the King James. And it says, how do you say that word? Ar Arcea? Arcea Grove to spy out secretly, saying, go view the land, especially Jericho. So the first part, these two men were sent out into to Jericho to spy out the land. Jericho was the first city after entering the land. It was considered... Um, in, 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 impenetrable, right? There was, 
there was these huge walls that were built there. They, they believed, they said it was walls up to the heavens. These walls were so big. They believed that the people in Jericho had enough food to sustain themselves for at least two years so they could wait it out. They could wait out a battle if someone was outside the gates trying to attack. They could wait it out for two years, they believed. The city was rich. The city had giants, they believed, these big, tall men. The, the, the saying is, when you, when you translate it in the original language, it says that they had long necks, right? You look at these tall basketball players, these, these seven-foot-tall guys, right? They got these long necks, right? So a lot of them. So I remember my cousin was a, bas- a really good basketball player in college, and, and he developed arthritis, couldn't go to the pros, but, but he was really good. And I just remember him being tall, skinny, had this long neck. And that's how they describe these people in this city, that they were giants, basically. If you read back a little bit, um, it talks about in, in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 13, when, when God first spoke to Moses, in, in, chap, in verse 2 it says, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe, their fathers, you shall send, s- send a man, every one a leader among them. Verse 28 says, Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Verse 30, Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. I love, I love Caleb because Caleb was so courageous all throughout his life. Everything you read about Caleb, he was conquering. Caleb had a, had a courage about himself that was amazing right so it's so lacking today right a lot of people don't have that courage these people were so afraid even at that time during the time of moses to go and take the land so many times when we're afraid of things god keeps bringing those things up over and over again until we conquer them he keeps bringing them up over and over again when i worked at target as a human resource manager they transferred me to a store that was far i mean it was really far i trained at like three different stores as a human resource manager and I was so stressed out when I started as a human resource manager, I was having panic attacks every single day. But I was having the panic attacks on the freeway. Every time I got on the freeway, I would get halfway to my store and have to pull over because I was having panic attacks. And at that time, I didn't understand what was going on. I thought I was having a heart attack, right? So I was short of breath, I was sweating, I was going through all these things. And, and I would pull over on the road, get out of my car on the freeway on the side and be can't breathe and call in my wife and say, hey, I think I'm having a heart attack. And blah, blah, blah. I went through that for at least a year, every single day. So for when I left, when I left Target, I wouldn't even, you can ask my wife, I wouldn't even get on a freeway for a year. It took me a year before I got back on the freeway. Even to my store that was probably 30 miles from my house, I started driving the street. I mapped it out and I drove on the street because I was so freaked out getting on a freeway. Every time I got on the freeway, I had a panic attack. Now, what does the Lord do to me? He sends me 100 miles from my house, right? I drive 100 miles every single day. And he told me, you're going to beat it. You're going to drive a lot. So I'm on the freeway all the time now, right? But it took years to get past it. It took years. These people were afraid to fight these people. They were afraid. So God said, what does God do? I'm going to present that to you every time until you conquer that fear. You're going to go in and you're going to give, take this land that I'm giving you, whether you want to or not. If he wants to bless us, sometimes we got to go through the fire in order to get that blessing that he has for us on the other side. Right? Sometimes we have to. And we don't want to. We want it easy. I don't want to fight Anik. Look how big these guys are, man. Right? God said, you don't want to drive on the freeway? I'll put you on the freeway every single day. And Pastor Rudy, William, I need your help in the children's ministry. I need you to drive this van to these different, um, to these different uh, museums every day. I'm like, Pastor Rudy, I don't want to drive. I need you. I need you, William. So I'm driving. F- even worse, I'm driving a van with 20 kids in the back <laughs> on the freeway. I'm freaking out. You know, and the kids are, ah, 
yeah, they're all playing in the back and having fun, and I'm freaking in the front. They don't know their driver's about to lose it. <laughs> right? How crazy is that, man? But that's how God works. Right? He don't want us to be afraid of anything. And if we are, he'll put those things in front of us over and over again until we beat it, right? But the awesome thing is, think of those guys that were in the fire, right? They said there was four men walking in this fire, right? We only put three in here, but yet there was four. Jesus was walking around in that heat with them. And all right, well, look at me. Stop being afraid. Look at me. When Peter was on that boat, right, those waves were tossed. They saw Jesus walk out there on the water. And Peter said, well, if it's really you, tell me to come to you. Peter gets out of the boat and starts walking. And Jesus says, just keep your eyes on me. And what does Peter do? He starts looking at the circumstances around him and he starts freaking out. Right? He starts freaking out. And what did he do? He started to sink. Lord, help me. If he had just kept his eyes where they were supposed to be from the start, he would have made it through. Right? If God tells you we're going on the other side, you're going on the other side. It's just a matter of all the drama that you have to go through in order to get to the other side. Right? He's raising us up for something. Right? In, 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 Luke, chapter, in Luke chapter 10... In Luke chapter 10, and I won't be able to find it because on, on my Bible it's 1195. I don't know about you guys. Uh, Pastor Jeff always said that. 1195, Luke chapter 10 is the blueprint for ministering, right? When, when these two men that went in to spy out the land, um, this is a blueprint because, again, Joshua is a type of Christ, right? So Jesus said, after these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them out two by two before his face into every city place where he himself was about to go then he said to them the harvest is truly great but the laborers are few therefore pray to the lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his field you think about the condition of today right there's millions of people that don't know how who god is what is there seven billion people on the planet out of seven billion people on the planet there's probably two billion christians which means that there's about 5 billion people that don't know who God is. When Noah was building that ark, God said, build the ark because I'm going to destroy the earth and the wickedness, right? Moses spent 120 years building this ark every day. People thought he was absolutely out of his mind. He was building this ark. It had never rained on the earth before that time. Noah, who did I say? Moses. Noah, sorry. Thank you. Noah built this ark. It took him 120 years. People thought he was crazy, right? And then it started to rain. All those people at that time died because they didn't believe. They didn't listen when they were warned. The same thing today, 2018. God is sending people out one at a time, two by two, saying, the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. There's pastors preaching all over the world. There's people uh, evangelizing. Greg Laurie has these big crusades every single year. And yet there's about 5 billion people that don't know who God is, that will perish at the end of all this because they don't believe, right? Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. And why are the laborers few? Because we're so into our own things. We're so into what we want to do with our lives instead of being sold out for the cause of Christ and realizing that we truly have the cure for the ills of this world. We have the cure for cancer in a sense, right? And that's eternity with God in heaven. After all this is over, all this drama is over, we have the cure. We walk around with it every single day. And we know, we know intellectually in our heads that there is something beyond this, right? But other, there's a lot of people that don't know. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, or sandals, and greet no one along the road. But wherever house you enter, first say peace to the house. And if, so, if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it. If not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give you. For the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. So Jesus is setting a blueprint in Luke chapter 10 for ministry, right? Just like these two men, these two spies that were sent in to spy out the land. They thought they were going in to spy out the land for an initial battle that was going to happen. But they were going to this house to meet this lady named Rahab 
Because Rahab needed to know who Jesus was, right? She needed to know who God was. She needed to come to an understanding of who God was, right? It was so much, it was so much beyond, more beyond that. And so, so the, the last part of verse 2, it says, So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. So who was this woman? Who was who's, who's Rahab? The Bible says that she was a harlot. Now, there's, there's two different translations, the Old and the New Testament. right? We know that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, most of it, right? And, and the New Testament in Greek. So if you read the Hebrew meaning of Rahab, it means that she was an innkeeper, a person who, who took care of the tavern, basically, right? So there's some belief that husbands would send their wives out to work or whatever, and, and she would, Rahab would go into these, would, would be in this place taking care of people, like an innkeeper of a, of a hotel or something, right? That's the Greek meaning. Now, the Hebrew meaning is actually harlot, that she was a harlot. And so I remember I listened to a, a commentary, I was listening to a study from John Corson on this back in like 19 whatever. And John Corson talked about that she was a harlot. Even though the two, the Greek and Hebrew meaning is completely different, she, she was a harlot. And so, but the amazing thing about it is God took this woman and, and used her in an amazing way, right? And, and, and so in Matthew chapter 1 verse 5, we, there's three places in the New Testament that mention uh, Rahab. So in Matthew uh, 1 verse 5, it says, Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse. And in verse 6 it says, And Jesse begot David the king. So God used this woman. She was the great-grandmother of, of King David. How amazing is that, that God took this person? See, he already knows, right, way back. He already knows how he's going to use someone. We don't know, but he does, right? We sit back and we're like, what's our ministry, Lord? What are we going to end up doing with our lives? And God already sees five, well, he sees everything, the beginning from the end, but he's already seen five steps ahead, and we're still back here trying to figure out what God wants us to do tomorrow, right? And he already knows. Rahab was a, was a simple innkeeper at this place. These two men went out to spy out the land. Rahab made all these amazing confessions of faith, became a, a believer in God, and she comes out to be the grand, great grandmother uh, of King David. That's the first thing. So we take in the book of James, in chapter 2 of James, she's mentioned again there. And you guys don't have to flip there. I'll read it. In James chapter 2, verse 20, it says, But you but you do, but do what you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see the faith was working together with his works? And by works faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Likewise was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. So the word justified, she was declared righteous because of what she'd done, right? It's so much more than just, you know, I, I hear people say, I'm, I'm praying, brother, I'm, wait, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I hear that all the time. I'm just waiting on the Lord, man. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, there's so much more to it than just that. The Bible says faith without works is dead. Not saying that God can't do whatever he wants. He can open doors that, what does the Bible say? He opens doors that, that no one can shed and sheds doors that no one can open. He can do whatever he wants. But I think sometimes he wants us to be an active participant in, in, what, in what he's doing. Because then as we walk through those doors, you know, we've actually got up and tried to make something happen. You know, I, I've been sick throughout my life on and off, just dealing with different things. 
And I've always had the mindset that I'm going to be... I'm going to be crawling, man, when I die because I'm never going to stop trying to make myself the strongest person I can be in God. I'm always going to be trying to improve myself in some kind of way because I don't want to, to not be able to be used fully in whatever God has for me because I'm limiting myself. In 2018, I, took a, I, I made a pledge to myself that I was going to better myself in 2018. My goal was 50 books to read, um, to exercise more, to love more, to try and be more of an encourager, to try and be more, uh, to help someone else. I made these goals for myself. And I'm not bragging saying, oh, I can read 50 books. Anybody can read 50 books. That's not the point. The, the, you know, I'm probably at 30 right now. But the point I'm trying to make is that faith, with, faith without works is dead. I, wanna, I study business. I study human resources. I study health and nutrition. I study fitness, and I could end up with a disease tomorrow. I'm not saying that I'm impenetrable to those things. All I'm saying is that I'm going to do my best. You know, I remember John Corson one time when I, he came to our church, Calvary Chapel Downey. I sat right next to him, and he said, do your best and commit the rest. And I know you guys have heard that saying before. Do your best, commit the rest. If we, if we, we do our best, we get up every single morning, and we give 100% to our lives by whatever we can to improve ourselves and improve, improve the people around us. Because as we improve ourselves, they're going to be better as well. My kids see me reading all the time. Dad, stop reading. Spend time with us watching TV. Or, or, or let's go to a movie. Or let's go to dinner. I'm always in a book. But I do that because I want to better myself. But I want my kids to see it also. And I want my wife to even see it as well. You know? Because I think it's just going to make us better. And so Rahab took that step of faith. And she hid these spies. Um, knowing that, number one, it probably could, it could have cost her her life. But she said, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that because I already know that God has, has given you guys the land. I know that already. right? And you'll see later on. We probably won't make it through the whole chapter. And that's fine. But <laughs> Because I want to take my time with this. So in verse 2 it says, And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho said to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men, hid them. So she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And it happened, in verse 5, And it happened as the gate was being shut, when it was dark, that the men went out. Where the men went, I do not know. Pursue them quickly, for you may overtake them. And so, did she lie? You know, we always talk about, you know, the thing these pastors always bring up is Rahab lied, right? We're not supposed to lie as believers, but she lied, right? She hid these men, and she, she basically lied. But if we look at the book of Hebrews, uh, in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 11, right? Obviously, it's a faith chapter. Um, in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, and I wouldn't have wrote down the verse. But anyway, I'll find it. Oh, here it is. In verse 31, it says, By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies with peace. The, the awesome thing about the, 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 the hall of faith or the chapter of faith is everything says by faith. Isn't that cool? Everything says by faith. It says by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempted to do so were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith the, habit, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she received the spies. 
all through this chapter, it talks about by faith. By faith, right? But it also talks about that they, had to, they did something as well. But by faith, Abraham left when God told him to leave. Right? All these things that were amazing. And then if you look at verse 22, and it says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak, Samson and Jephthah also, David and Samuel and the prophets. So all through, the, all through this chapter, it talks about faith. But what's, what's amazing about it, it doesn't bring up one time what their sins were back in the Old Testament. Right? It doesn't bring it up one time. Samson, we know, did a bunch of stuff, right? Lost his eyes. He, he was with this woman he wasn't supposed to be. Shaved his head. All these other things. But the Bible and the New Testament, he's still in the hall of faith. So what stood out to me about that and what's awesome is that we don't have to be perfect because God knows that we're not going to be. Right? He already knows. I, man, I fall short every day. I always tell my wife, I don't, know, I don't know why God uses me. My wicked sometimes. I mean, it just blows my mind, some of the stuff that goes through my mind. And yet God keeps telling me, I want to use you. You know, Rahab lied in the, in, in the Old Testament, but it doesn't mention it in the New Testament, right? There's this dispersion between the old and the new, right? All, all, all things are passed away. Become, behold, all things become new. God doesn't remember our sins of the past. When we confess our sins and when we ask forgiveness, he doesn't remember them. He cast them behind him. He does not remember them, right? Rahab did an amazing thing. She's mentioned in the hall of faith because of that, because of what she had done. And so we beat ourselves up sometimes because the enemy tells us we're liars. We're not good people. We're all these things. God, why does God want to use you, right? But yet he keeps telling me, just... Just keep moving forward and do what I'm calling you to do. Despite me, despite myself. And I fight. I'm telling you guys, I can tell you some stories. I fight against God. I'm like, I don't want to do it. He tells me to do stuff sometimes, I don't want to do it. When I worked at Calvary, so many times, God would tell me, go tell Pastor Jeff this. No, I don't want to. Go tell this pastor that. Tell him he was wrong for what he said. No, I don't want to. That's how I battle with God. I'm that guy who wrestled and got the hip broken, man. I was like, no, I don't want to do it. But yet he, kept, he keeps using me over and over again, just like all of us, right? He uses Jim for worship, his, his voice. He uses each one of us for whatever he uses us for, despite us. So, verse 6. But she had bought them up on the roof and hidden them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. Now, the roof was flat at the time, right? All these roofs were flat at the time. And I know we know that that's a horrible way to make a roof nowadays, right? Because they always leak. When I was a manager at, at Lucky's way back in the day, I remember we had a flat roof. And they had, if you get on top of the roof, there was a ladder. Because we used to have to go on top of the roof sometimes and, and deal with the, this huge AC that was probably as big as this room. And we'd have to climb up there and work with these controls and all that. And I remember one time it was raining. I mean, it was raining really hard. And they're like, hey, you're the manager. Go up there and deal with it. <laughs> so I had to climb up on the roof. And, and, and it was, the roof was flat. And there was walls around the building that were probably this high. So I had to climb over and get on the roof. And I got on top of the roof. And there was probably water up to here on the roof. And they wanted me to mess with this electrical panel <laughs> that was on top of the roof. I'm like, are you guys crazy? First of all, I'm not an electrician. I don't know anything about wiring. So I get up there. I'm, wa I'm walking through this slush of water, man. And I'm thinking, and, and inside the store, it's leaking water everywhere. Everywhere. There's, they have buckets. This is a multi-billion dollar company. And they got buckets on the floors. And water's leaking into these buckets. I'm like, how ridiculous is this, man? Just get somebody to fix it. Anyway. That's how the roofs were back in those days. Now, flax, guys, these are some things about flax that, that's really amazing. That's probably going to blow your mind. Flax was used um, flax for a lot of different things. People would lay out flax. It's, I wrote down in my notes, the roof was flat in the time, and people would lay out stuff to dry on the roof. They would bring stuff up on top of the roof. You remember when you were a kid, your mom used to hang up laundry and stuff? 
like they bring up stuff to dry, whether it was whether it was washed fruit or laundry or whatever it was, and the spies were covered underneath this flax, but the flax is used all throughout the Bible, right? The rope that that bound Samson was made of flax. The the priests, their coverings were made of flax. All these things are made of flax. Talks about linen and and was a mixture of flax. So it was used all throughout the Bible. And so as she covered these men up, they were basically being being covered by, by God in a sense, right? As it talks about the priests, how they were protected and covered by, by, by this material. So I have more later on about it if we make it, but it says, Then the men pursued them by the road to the Jordan to the fords, and as soon as those who pursued them had gone out, they shut the gate. In verse 8, it says, Now before they lay down, she came up on top of the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you this land, that the terror of you have fallen on us, and all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. Now, this happened 40 years previously when she, was, she talked about this story. So she knew the power of God. This, this lady was a believer. She knew the power of God. She had a fear of God. She knew the facts about God already because she talked about things that happened way in the past. And she, and she talked about these battles that had happened before. It says, For we heard how the Lord dried up the water, the Red Sea, for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon, Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And so she... She had a dramatic conversion. She already knew. So this was so much far or more beyond just her saving the spies. God had prepared her to do all her battles in life to be the grandmother of King David, right? We go through all these battles in our lives and we wonder, well, why am I going through all this? What's all this for? You know, um, like I talk about just different things I've been through in my own life. I mean, that's what I can draw from, my own experiences. Um, just different issues I've gone through in my own life and I sit back even today and wonder what's it all for? You know, what? When I got laid off at Calvary I was off work for 13 months looking for a job. 13 months I was out of a, I was out of a job and I was so bitter. I was just so bitter because when I walked around Calvary I loved it there, man. I loved it there. I, I, I got to work at 8 in the morning I worked seven minutes from my home you know all day I walked around and got a chance to talk about the Bible and and just be around people that believed and tr there's drama everywhere so anytime you, you add people to the equation it's always jacked up so I'm not think I'm not telling you guys it was heaven but I loved it and and when I got laid off I was destroyed man I was I was destroyed you know because I thought I was going to be there for the rest of my life. I thought I would be Pastor Glenn walking around someday, you know. Huh? I was married. Yeah. My wife and I got married in 96, and we started going to church in 96 there. So we got married. We got married. I went to, went, went to the church with my brother-in-law, who wasn't my brother-in-law at the time. I became a Christian, and then a week later, my wife came to Calvary in 96 and became a Christian. And then a month later, we drove to Vegas and got married. So, our, so pretty much our, our whole time, we were believers there. But it was hard. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that Rahab was prepared, was being prepared her whole life for what she had done. And each time, each one of us, right, God prepares us in our own way. Some of us are, are everybody's different. I'm writing a book right now. I've been praying about it. God's been laying it on my heart for, for at least a year to write a book. So I'm writing a book on how we hear God's voice. Um, and I'm doing that because, he, number one, he laid it on my heart. And, and I want to do that. That's one of my goals in life is to, is to, to write books. I really want to put out, I want to I be, be an author. That's one of my goals. That's one of my things I've set. And I'm like, okay, God, so what do you want me to write about? And this is what he's given me. So I'm going to go for it and see what happens. But... Um, he prepares us in a way that he does. You know, I've, like I said, I've dealt with a lot of stuff in my, a lot of health stuff in my life. And that's, that gave me, that's what gave me the drive to exercise. Because 
I, I, like I've had panic attacks on and off for years. The ambulance will come to my home in the middle of the night. Um, I've dealt with vertigo on and off for a big part of my life. Just a lot of different things. And a lot of it was caused because of, of my own stuff, you know? A lot of stuff we bring on ourselves, you know? But, but I, I've dealt with it on and off for years, just being stressed out at work and, and letting all this stuff bother me. And, and it, instead of opening up and talking about it, I internalized it all and it made me sick. And I spent years dealing with it. I remember one time my back was so bad, I was having tingling in my legs because I worked in a milk box in the cold for years. And so I, have, I still have arthritis in my lower back. But I remember I went to, God told me, go to the men's prayer. My back was so bad that I was like having shock waves in both of my legs. I was having problems even walking. I walked into the men's prayer and I kid you not, I got there, I sat down and there was people, I, I even remember it, there was a lady that came in there that was in her 30s that had a brain tumor. We prayed for her. There was a couple of other people. I didn't even pray until the very last person I didn't go up to pray. And the only reason why I did was because that's what I was there for. But God already had healed me when I sat there. I felt this heat in the back of my in the back of my back, in the, in the center of my back. The whole time I was sitting there praying for other people, it was this heat that was back there. And then at the end, I was already healed. And at the end, they were like, is there anybody else? And so I raised my hand, and, uh, and I said, all right, well, I'm here for that, too. So I get up, and I remember Pastor Rudy was on one side, and Pastor Glenn was on the other side. And I was already working at the church at the time. And you know Glenn, he's the biggest jokes in the world. He's rubbing my head. Hey, <laughs> hey, William. And he's laughing and making a joke of it. And then finally, I told him what was going on, and then they, they anointed me with oil and prayed. But I was already healed 10 minutes before I even went up there. And I walked out. You know, God is amazing like that. You know, he, like this woman who, who was sick for 12 years, you know, she's, she just ran through the crowd and said, I just got to touch Jesus. I know that my healing comes from him. I just got to touch him, and I'm going to be made well. Jesus is in this crowd. You guys know the story. He's bumping all these people, and all these people are surrounding him. And this lady, I can even see it in my head, so clear. She just rushes into the crowd and just grabs him, and instantly she's made well. After spending all this money on physicians and all these other things, 12 years. She suffered for 12 years. Why? I, I always ask, why do you let us suffer for so long? Like, my back was messed up for a long time. Even today, I have back problems. And God told me recently, just start doing yoga. Start doing yoga. And I do yoga now at least three or four days a week. And my back feels amazing. It's not healed because I still get the pains in my back. But it feels so much better. He's speaking all the time to us, guys. All the time. All we have to do is listen. I'll give you one more story. And then I'll go through a couple more verses and then we'll stop. I was at CVS on my route. And I'm sitting in my car, getting ready to go into a store. We look at our iPads to see the sales before we go in so we know what to sell. So I'm sitting in my car and I'm reading. This guy walks up to me and asks me for money. And he had a backpack on and he's like, you have any money, sir? I said, no, I don't have money, but sometimes we carry samples. I said, I got some samples in the back. I'll give you that. So I get out of the car and I, I take all these drinks out and I'm giving him the drinks. And he turns and he looks at me and he says, Start listening to the voice in your head. God is speaking to you in your head. Just listen. I'm like, okay. And he walked away. And that's how that's, I hear it. <laughs> it's always confirmed through the word. But it has to be confirmed because the devil does the same thing. Right? So we have to know the difference between the two. And sometimes I get it wrong. I'm not saying I always get it right. I thought that was from God. But it wasn't. But a lot of times it is. Anyway, we'll take two more verses, and then we'll stop. So in verse, uh, verse 12, Now therefore I beg you, swear to me by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will also show kindness to my father's house, and give me a true token. And spare my, my father, my mother, and my brothers and sisters, and all that I have, and deliver our lives from death. 
Then she led down a rope through the window for her house was on the city wall and she dwelt on the wall. So I'm going to stop at verse 15. It says, Then she let them down by the rope through the window for her house was on the city wall and she, she dwelt on the wall. And so in, in verse 15, you know, what's these countries that have a lot of prostitution? Like they have what's called a red line district, right? Right? And in and, 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 and these cities or these places where this prostitution is really heavy, they have the windowsills painted red, right? The red line district, they call it, right? And so this is a thing, right? And so the flax cord was painted red that she was supposed to let down. And so she let down the flax cord so these spies would see it when they came back and wouldn't kill her family. So you got the red seal and you had the red cord and it made the cross. Isn't that amazing? And so they would see the cross when they came back into the city to destroy the city. And that's how she was protected, right, and her family. And they told him, don't go out of the house because if you go out of the house, you're on your own, basically, right? And it, we can read different stories in the Bible. Paul, when he was um, in the ship going to this place and these men wanted to get off the boat and Paul said, if you get off this, I can guarantee your lives are going to be okay as long as you stay on this ship. But if you get off the ship, basically you're on your own. Right or in the Old Testament too, in Moses, right, put the blood around the doorpost. When when this thing happened with the Egyptians, right, God told him, you put the blood around the post around your home, you'll be safe. And there's a sense of this protection through God. I always call it the we used to call it the Calvary bubble when we worked at Calvary, right, the Calvary bubble. So for the believer, there's this protection, there's this wall around the believers as long as we stay inside that protection, right. But, but sometimes we wander outside of it, right? And we want to test the waters on the outside. Man, I miss doing this. I miss doing that, man. You know, I don't get to drink as much with my friends as I used to be able to or this or that, right? But as long as you stay within that, within God's arms, not that he, his arms are everywhere, but you get the idea. And there's a safety. So, um. I'm not going to finish the chapter, but I'm going to just take one more verse. In, in Joshua chapter 21, verse 45, in verse 45, 21:45 says, Not a word failed of any good thing which the Lord had spoken to the house of Israel all came to pass. So, isn't that amazing that all through the battles, from the time God spoke to Abraham and said, Abraham, get out of your country. I'm going to do an amazing thing to you. Your, your descendants are going to be slaves in a foreign land for 400 years, blah, blah, blah. But I'm going to make them a great nation. From the time he spoke to Abraham until chapter 21 of the book of Joshua, all the preparation, all the wars, all the death, all the drama, all the disbelief, all the famine, all those other things that happened in between all that, at the end of all that, it says, not a word failed. When God tells us something, bank on it, right? That's the whole thing, is that we have to, we believe it. He spits these promises out to us, not spit them out, but he gives us these promises. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. He doesn't say when. It took, I don't know how many years it was between Abraham and Joshua. I mean, I, I, maybe 3,000 years or something. A, a thousand years, maybe, maybe fifteen hundred years, maybe about a thousand, fifteen hundred years. It took for these people to get their land dispersed, for each one of them to get their disbursement of land, right? I, I don't know why God makes us wait so long for what He promises us, but He does. You know, Abraham. It took forever for him to have Isaac. He waited. God gave him the promise. So anyway, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. Um, I didn't get to finish the chapter, but that's fine. Um, I pray for everyone here. Whatever we're dealing with, each person is dealing with something individually. Some might be lack of faith, might be uh, work issues, might be health issues, might be um, just general direction. For me, I feel like it's direction for me. I mean, sometimes I feel like I have no idea what I'm doing or where I'm going. And so... 
I pray for each one of us. Thank you so much for the word today. And um, I pray that it meant something to someone. Um, and so bless our afternoon. Give us Traveling Mercy's home. I pray for our families and our friends, our children, um, everything they may be going through in their lives. I pray that you touch their bodies and heal them as well. I pray that you give courage where needed, strength where needed, patience where needed. Um, and uh, just keep, keep our hearts strong, Lord, so that we can continue this fight, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.